In this video, we assume that you've already calculated some refraction statics and have gone ahead and picked some stacking velocities. So in this video, we will create a new set of shot gathers with surface consistent decon applied, create a CMP index to be able to create some CMPs with NMO applied, and we'll calculate some re reflection residual static corrections. So we can open up our prep module, and we will see our raw shot gathers. I'm going to go to another shot to display that on this shot. And we want to create a set of shot gathers with surface consistent decon applied. So we'll need to set up a processing sequence to do that. I have already gener generated one in advance. So we'll notice here, uh, of course, here you can grab the modules from the left side to put them into the flow, etc. Um, there are a set of standard modules in the top window. In the second window here, there's a bunch of modules that you'll also like to use. And in the third window here, you have the option of importing your own modules if you like. If you have your favorite module, uh, it is fairly straightforward to import that module into GeoTrust to be able to use it yourself. Under File here, I can go Load. And I can load a preset uh, parameter file that I've generated, decon solve. So you can see here, when I load that parameter file, uh, I have the modules that I've generated earlier. So uh, there is also the append option. If you append a .par file, uh, that will be added to the bottom of this flow. Any job that you run in GeoTrust, the, there will be a .par file that has these modules, basically has the re a record of what you use to generate that output seg y. So that can be handy for retracing your steps. In this case, I'm, uh, I've called in these modules, uh, TX scale to apply spherical divergence correction. Uh, HAN is basically a module that will do high amplitude noise attenuation. So it will basically scale down some of the higher amplitude, low frequency energy uh, between 0 and 15 hertz. Editing basically will allow me to apply any uh, trace edits that I may have picked in the first module. I'll go to Picker here. We have the option of applying trace kills. I did that with the left mouse button, highlight some traces to be killed. I can drag, right mouse click and drag across again to undo those trace kills. I can also do trace reversals. Um, these traces are reversed on the fly. Right mouse click and drag across to undo those. When you do this in the picker module, that will create a file in the background associated with the file name say Y file name. And in this case, that's what I'm calling to apply the edits that I uh, did in the picker module. So by browsing and selecting this file, uh, I will actually be able to apply the trace edits or trace reversals that I generated from the first picker module. The decon design is just a module that will allow you to see the window uh, it's purely a module that will allow you to window the data. In this case, I'm just using it to allow me to see what window I may want to use to design my decon operators. So in this case, uh, the minimum and maximum offset, I'm defining a window at 200 meters and 3,500 meters. At the 200 meter offset, uh, my window will go from 300 milliseconds to 31. At the far offset that I've specified, my window will go from 2,200 to 34. And there's a taper on that window. This decon design will actually apply that windowing to the data. Uh, you can use that just as a QC to check your window, or you can simply uh, not include that modu module if you want. Um, the decon solve module will allow me to generate a, a file with the service consistent components, and I will need to specify the window here. Uh, and in this case, I have the same window specified as I did with my decon design window. Uh, again, I could choose to not include this 
I can right click to comment that module out. Right click again, we'll include it. And we'll step through this flow just so that you'll see uh, the effect of each module here. By clicking the arrows here, uh, I can step forward. Actually, one thing I'm going to do, since this decon solve is creating a file, I'm going to, uh, I'm basically going to put some other name there because this will, if I do this interactively, it will actually overwrite that file. Uh, I don't think any of these other ones are creating a file. So I'll just change that name so I will not overwrite the file that I generated when I ran this job earlier. And now we can step through each module using the arrow keys up here on the right to step to the next processing module. Or we could also use the arrows on the keyboard. So here we're applying spherical divergence. Here we're applying the HANA, which you can see is removing some of that, or scaling down some of the high amplitude, low frequency energy. So this is before HANA, this is after. In the HANA module, you could actually see the difference between the uh, before and after. And with any module, you could also display the difference of the previous module with this, the application of this module. Now we'll go forward to the editing module. In this case, you can see there was a reverse trace on the left here. I'll go before, after. So that's just the effect of the editing module. The decon design, we can see that here, I, this is the window of data that I've chosen to design my decon operators. Again, this decon design is an optional process to include. It's just allowing me to visually uh, see the window that I'm using when I run decon solve. I will step forward to the decon solve module. It will turn red because it's an undetermined solution with only one shot. So interactively, you can't do the decon solve module. Uh, but the decon solve module does need to be the last uh, module in the flow. What I, what I would do here is if I'm satisfied with this flow, I would then actually apply this job to run it, and that will generate the service consistent decon, uh, decon solve file. So I've gone ahead and I've run that job, and really all we wanted was the output file from that decon solve, and then we're ready to run another job where we're actually going to apply the decon. So the service consistent decon uh, is done in two steps. First you run the decon solve and then you'll need to run the decon apply. So we would open up prep again. Again we're back to our raw shots. Go to shot 100. And again I can go, since I've already set up this flow, I'll go to processing sequence. Now file load. In my case I will sometimes the default doesn't show all the PAR files, um, flow to create shots with the refraction statics. Okay, so this is a flow that I've generated earlier. Uh, TX scale, to applying the spherical divergence, the same HANA, scaling down some of the low frequency energy, editing to apply the trace edits, and here's where we're applying econ apply, where we actually use this um, components file that we generated in the decon solve job and we'll apply a spiking decon in this case. Here we are applying the refraction statics that we generated from the tomography. That's the long wavelength and here are the refraction residuals. Again we want to specify the floating datum file or in this case we have the floating datum and intermediate datum in the same file but they can be in separate files. So by inputting the floating datum, that this tells the this will input into the bytes 53 and 57 in the trace header where this data has actually been corrected to. So right now the data is hung from the floating datum after we apply these statics. So we need to populate bytes 53 and 57 with that floating datum so we can tell the program where the data is actually sitting. The replacement velocity will be put into the header as well. Then we're actually going to apply a band pass filter. Um, 
AGC. In this case, this hand is actually sort of acting like a notch filter. Um, we'll see that in this data set, there's some high amplitude, 50 hertz, uh, and it's harmonics, uh, some noise. So basically, we'll use that just to try to reduce that. You can choose, you may not want to use that process, but we'll see. Here, what we're doing is we are taking the synthetic travel time that was generated from the travel time tomography. Um, these are the synthetic first breaks generated from the final velocity model. And we're inputting those into bytes 221 in the trace center. Here we're going to display that. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to apply a first break mute along the, that travel time. And so we're taking the information from byte 221, and we're basically going to mute the data above the first breaks. We can apply uh, a bit of, uh, in this case, we are applying that mute uh, right at the synthetic first breaks at time zero, and then at, at offset zero. And then for the farther offsets, we are saying let's mute down 50 milliseconds. And you can add more control points there if you want. And since the synthetic is not generated at the beyond the first and last shot, we would probably want to specify some uh, offset for which to extrapolate that mute, uh, some velocity. So in our case, I can specify a velocity of 2200 meters per second, and that will extend the mute function for any traces that do not have a synthetic travel time generated. So in this case, we're generating a set of shot gathers with the surface consistent decon applied, as well as the refraction statics. And they're also going to be filtered in AGC. And we're going to use this to proceed forward to calculate some reflection residual statics. So we would uh, click Apply here to save this sequence. We would select some nodes to run the job on, the number of cores per node. Um, click Apply to save that sequence, and then we would Click Apply here to run that job. Uh, for now, let's step through each of these just to see the effect of them. Uh, TX scale, applying the spherical divergence. Anna is scaling down the low frequency noise. The editing, again, in this case, is correcting for a reversal. Here, we're applying the uh, surface consistent decon. We can see that we do have some of these spikes at 50 hertz, 100 hertz, et cetera. Uh, we're applying the long wavelength refraction statics, and we're applying the refraction-based residuals, and we're applying a bandpass filter, filtering the data back quite a bit. Um, the, we see with the AGC, this has highlighted the spike at 50 hertz. And that's why we put the HANA in. At this case, we said basically between around 50 hertz, we just want to scale that energy down. Uh, so we can see the change in the amplitude spectra. This is all relative to the highest amplitude. So we can see we've scaled down the 50 hertz. Uh, you can choose to include that or not. We see before and after we have scaled down some of the 50 hertz noise. Then we're applying. We are loading the synthetic travel time into the header using FB header. Then we're going to plot it just so we can take a look and make sure that it looks OK. And then by applying FB mute, we'll be muting above the synthetic travel time. So we would run that job, and we would generate a set of shot gathers with the refraction statics applied. I've gone ahead and I've done that. Close that. Since I've run that already, I can now uh, open up this file. I created a, a set of shot gathers with the refraction statics applied. And what I'd like to do now is uh, generate a set of CMP gathers with NMO applied. So in order to generate the CMP gathers, I'll need to generate a CMP index. So here in prep, under options, geometry map. When you first open this, 
you will not see the CNP grid. So in fact, I'll go back here, close this. When I open up prep, um, this here I have my raw shots. I have not generated a CMP index associated with the raw shots file. And in general, the CMP indices can be the same for different input files. However, if you've applied trace kills, you'd want to make sure you use an index file that is uh, the same, has the same number of traces, etc., as the data set that you're using to resort the data. So in this case, I would open up the geometry map. The first time you do this, you will not see any uh, CMP grid to see your shots and receivers. And you would specify a spacing, a CMP spacing. And the super bin, if you choose to, you can create a super bin uh, CMP index. And so I could say if I want to create one, I would create it for five CMPs together. And this create will actually just output the CMP grid here. I'll zoom in just to show these gray lines are the CMP bins. All you've done here is created them for the map. I'll right click to unzoom. Now for offset, I'm not going to create any different offset indices now, so I'll just include all offsets. Uh, and I can now click apply and I'll get a fold map. So my fold ranges from 1 to 110. If I needed to, I could shift the CMP bin slightly. In my case, it doesn't appear as I need to do that. Then I would build index file. Common midpoint. Really all I need is a CMP index file to be able to generate CMPs. I, for now, I do not need to worry about any of these other indices. I would click apply and I would create a CMP index file uh, it's got the file name associated with the input shot gather. As I mentioned earlier, I, I have done that previously for my input file of my shot gathers with the refraction statics. So here is my shot gathers with refraction statics applied. If I take a look at the geometry map there, I can see that it will automatically load up the CMP grid that I had generated previously. Once I've generated a CMP index, I'm now ready to use a uh, one of the C one of the modules called Read CMP. Read CMP will allow me to browse in uh, the CMP index file I generated. It's, again, it's got a name associated with the input shot gathers. And by doing that, that will sort the data from shot to CMP. So the read CMP, the sort will need to be the first uh, step of any sequence that you want to do the sorting with. So in my case, I've generated a flow previously. I'll load that flow. flow to create CMPs with NMO. Okay, so here I use read CMP as the first module. And I've grabbed the CMP index. And I don't need to worry about specifying a CMP range. If I want to view a certain CMP interactively, I would need to fill in the CMP range here to be able to see that CMP interactively. The next, but, but in this case, sorry, that is not necessary. NMOF is going to be applying NMO from floating datum. So I will grab the stacking velocity file that I generated in RMSL. And I will need to specify the datum. It has to be the same datum that was used to generate those constant velocity stacks. In my case, it's 127 meters. Uh, it has to be the same replacement velocity that was used to generate the constant velocity stacks so that everything is referenced properly. And I can choose to apply a stretch mute to the data after the application of NMO. In my case, I'm using 15. And uh, 
I can view this interactively if I want. Uh, sometimes what I would do if uh, since read CMP will only allow you to look at one CMP at a time, if you want to check the application of your NMO, you could simply comment out the read CMP to take a look at one shot with the NMO applied, for example. And here, in a second here, we'll see the NMO applied on that shot. And you can use that to perhaps gauge what type of stretch mute we may want to apply. So I can change the stretch mute percentage there, hit enter, and in a minute here, I'll see that actual shot with that different stretch mute applied. So in my case, I chose stretch mute of 15. And of course, I had to make sure I applied read CMP to sort the data and output this data set in a CMP order. Uh, in my case, I generated a file called 2D CMPs with NMO. So I ran this job and created a CMP order data set with NMO applied. And that's what I used as input to go ahead to run the stack power residuals, reflection residuals. So in the stats module, stack power residuals, uh, I need an input, I need an input file that has the uh, NMO CMPs. And I need to specify a window and I need to specify an output file name. Typically, we do not generate the trim statics. Uh, you'd specify a certain number of nodes to use and a certain number of cores per node. In my case, I took a look at the big Y file that I generated when I was picking the velocities. I created a composite SIG Y file and I could take a look at this and decide what window I might want to use for my statics computation. In my case, I chose quite a large window. And again here, I can shoot, since I've already run this, I can load the parameters and I can actually see the parameters that I used uh, to generate this set of statics. Here's my input file, the window I used, number of iterations, and the maximum shift per trace. So I've, I've gone ahead and run that job, and it generated a set of shot and receiver residuals, which I can take a look at here by opening the statics file. The underscore one, two, and three are the individual iterations. I really want to look at the, the final result, the stack power residuals. And here are my residual statics. We can see here, for example, this receiver was one of the receivers that I did reverse. And that's the cause of that big jump. Because it wasn't reversed prior to the calculation of the refraction residual. Now that I've created refraction residuals, I want to create a stack. I want to stack up the data with and without those residuals. So I'll open up prep. I'll open my, there's a couple of different ways you could do this, but I'll start with my shot gathers with the refraction statics applied. So I'll input that data set and I'll go to processing sequence. And basically I would want to apply the uh, to, to stack this data, I want to apply read CMP to sort it to CMPs, apply the NMO, and then add in the reflection residuals and stack the data. In my case, since I've already run this job, I would, uh, instead of having to re-sort this and everything, I'll just load in the parameter file that I used to generate my stack. So I generated a stack, a root stack, by calling in, uh, sorting the CMPs, applying the NMO, 
just stacking the data. So this has no static, no reflection residual static supplied and in band pass AGC. And I ran that job to generate that stack. Then I ran a job to generate a brute stack with the residual static supplied. And the only difference was the application of the reflection residuals, the stack power residuals that we just saw. So I run that job to generate both of those stacks, those two jobs to generate both of those stacks. And now I can take a look at them under the main utility here, display segway trace. File, open files, so I can click on one of them to just view one of them at a time. In my case, I'm going to also hit control and click on the second stack. So now I've selected two SIGY files that I can compare within this display. And I'll open those. And I'm able to flip back and forth between them. And I see the file that I'm looking at here. So this stack is without the stack power residuals, and this stack has the stack power residuals applied. So without the residuals and with, without, with. I use quite a large window, so you need to compare this in a general sense over the entire window. Uh, but in general, there's good improvement from the reflection residuals. You may choose to uh, apply these statics to go ahead and refine your stacking velocities to run a second pass of reflection residuals if you wish. Uh, and the methodology would be the same. 